OK, let's get going. So um, hi, everybody. My name is Chris Lewin. I'm a physics engineer. I work on the um, physics team uh, at Frostbite, which is EA's game engine. Um, so I've been asked to remind you not to video this and to fill in your evaluation forms at the end. So thank you in advance for that. Um, OK, so um, one thing I would like to point out before we start is this is a physics talk, but there's no mathematics. Um, it feels sort of foolishly simple when I remove the maths from it, so I would appreciate it if you pretend that this is really difficult. Um, if you want to see that stuff, then you can download the technical report that I've written on it right now, which does contain all of the grisly details. Um, but this is only half an hour, so I don't really have time to put those in here. Okay, so what is self-collision? What is this all about? So um, most people are familiar with cloth and are familiar with the sort of attractive shapes that make on a body. Um, and in games, we often want to capture these things in some way, um, whether by you know, just putting it in a, in a normal map, in a texture, or by uh, animating it, or by simulating it. Um, more recently in games, the more common way to do a lot of different types of clothing has been to simulate it, because the clothing is likely to be attached to a character that the player has control over. And in that case, it's very difficult to capture all the deformations that the cloth can go through uh, just with uh, like traditional authored means. Um, so self-collision is the phenomenon where the, the cloth collides with itself, and it can wrinkle and get into piles. Maybe you can knot it, um, and you can have uh, layers of cloth which slide over each other. And uh, the layered clothing use case in particular covers a lot of different types of clothing, most of which you're probably wearing right now. So I would hope you're familiar with that. So let's talk very briefly about how you go about simulating cloth, like at a basic level. Um, most production cloth simulations that try to be real time do some kind of uh, nonlinear projected Gauss Seidel solver, which sounds kind of unpleasant, but what it really means is that you have a series of constraints between particles. Um, and then you just go over those constraints and solve them so that they're satisfied. So you might have length constraints which cause the cloth to maintain the same length. And to solve that constraint would mean to go over each constraint and say, well, is it longer than it should be? If it is, then we'll shorten it so that it's the correct length. Or if it's shorter than it should be, we'll lengthen it. So we use length constraints to constrain the, um, the stretching of the cloth and the shearing of the cloth and also the bending of the cloth. Um, and if you've got this on a runtime character, then you probably need a bunch of other constraints to keep the cloth in vaguely the right sort of place. And we have a lot of different types of these, but one of the most basic ones is that we just have an anchor constraint, which is a sphere that the, clo the cloth point can sort of live in, where the center of the sphere is defined by the animation that you put into it. And so in the absolute worst case, where all of your other constraints have failed to keep the cloth in the right place, you can always be certain that it's never going to stray too far away from where, it, where your animation would have put it. Um, and then we also have contact constraints, which is you've got some sort of collision representation of the body underneath the cloth, like maybe a, a sphere for the head or a capsule for the arm. Um, and you need to make sure that the cloth stays on the outside of these colliders rather than going through them. Otherwise, they wouldn't be very good colliders. Um, and for that, we use contact constraints. But wait a second. Why am I representing contact with something like a, a sphere or a, um, or a capsule as uh, just a, a plane? Um, so I'm going to talk now about uh, discrete and continuous collision detection and what it actually means to use contacts. And the relevance of this will become obvious later when I talk about how this uh, concerns self-collision. Okay? So um, sort of obvious way to do collision detection in a particle-based simulator is to do it with discrete calculations. So that basically means that you don't worry about the velocity of the point. Say you've got, in this case, we've got a, um, like a capsule. And there's a point which is inside the capsule. And you can very easily work out the correct way to push it out. So you push it out by the shortest path, and that is resolution of your collision. Um, and it's not too difficult to work out whether a point is inside a capsule or whether a point is inside almost any other shape. Um, but there are a lot of issues with this approach. When you start considering velocities of the points, and maybe the colliders have velocity as well, maybe they have a, a translation and a rotation. Um, and in that case, you start getting issue, issues like this, where if you're doing discrete time stepping, where you have one time step and then um, 30 milliseconds later, the point has a velocity which puts it the other side of the collider, then when you say, oh, it's inside, I've got to push it out, it gets pushed out the wrong way. And this um, will show up in your cloth simulator as 
colliders very easily pushing their way through the cloth. Um, and that can be very distracting. Um, and there are other issues, like if their velocities are high enough that it never even touches the collider, then you won't notice that at all. And, and that will, I mean, that's the classic bullet through paper effect that you see in a lot of uh, old style physics simulations. Um, but there are more pernicious issues, like for instance, even if you don't even have any velocities in your simulation at all, every uh, point is probably connected to some other constraints, which are going to pull it around. And um, so let's say in this case, they, they've pulled it into this configuration, and that's the other side of the collider from where it started at the beginning of the frame, and when we push it out, it goes to the other side. So um, you, you can't just look at the velocities of the points because there's going to be some other movement generated by other constraints in your system. So discrete collision detection has a bunch of issues with it, which we would like to fix. So a classic way to try to deal with this is using some form of continuous collision detection. And for the purposes of this, I'm, I'm using continuous collision detection to mean collision detection that considers the velocities and trajectories of the things that you're trying to stop them from interpenetrating. Um, kind of a most basic naughty way of doing this is just to subdivide your time step into as many time steps as is required. You just run your simulation at like 4,000 hertz or something, and then as long as your velocities aren't too high, you'll never get to a point where things move too much in one time step. Um, but this is obviously hilariously expensive, so we don't do it. So another thing is to do some sort of closed form calculation between your, your objects and work out in this time interval from like zero to one between two different frames, are they actually going to hit each other? And even if, even if they're not hitting like at, at the beginning state or at the ending state, there might be some state in between where they, where they intersect. And you can also work this out. It can be very expensive for some kinds of primitives. It can be reasonably cheap for others. Um, so it's not a good general solution to the problem. Um, and then the remedy for this that we use, that I'm going to talk about now, that we use in our cloth simulator and also most modern rigid body simulators use, we call predictive contacts. Some people call it speculative contacts. But the idea is that you, um, you kind of reject the idea, of the, the, the idea of the second thing where you're trying to find the time of impact between two objects. And you say, well, actually, I just want to know if they're going to be vaguely in the same sort of space as each other. I, I don't need, want to know exactly if they're really going to collide. I just know that if they're near each other, other constraints may push them around so that they will be going through each other. So I just want to have a sort of fuzzy idea of when they're going to be in the same place as each other. And if we think that one is going to go through the other, then we can generate a, um, a simplified representation of the collision, which is what we actually solve in our solver. So in this case, we say, oh, it's probably going to go through the capsule. So we create this plane. And then when we um, solve this constraint, we push it out of the plane instead of pushing it out of the capsule. And even though it doesn't go to the same place that it would go to if we had like, solved the fully continuous problem, the critical thing is that it stays on the right side of the capsule. So um, your cloth is going to stay on the right side of your limb. And that's very important for uh, like the fidelity of your simulation. So how does this deal with some of the cases that we were looking at just now? Um, so in this case, where it was going to go all the way through, we generate a contact, and it stays on the right side of it. In this case, where it was going to go partially through and get pushed out the wrong way, we do the same thing. And in this case, uh, this third case illustrates that we need to use some kind of fuzzy logic, like a radius that says, if the things are going to be close together, like within some epsilon defined by how, how long our constraints are, then we need to generate a contact even if we don't think they're going to hit each other due to their velocities. And in that case, we, we pull the particle through due to some other constraints, and it gets pushed out again in the right direction. Um, and this really helps with issues where, like for instance, you've got some cloth that's rubbing over a collider that's bearing a heavy weight that's going to be pulled down by the other constraints. It needs to be pushed back up again in the right direction. So what are the conditions for creating a contact? Well, if the point starts inside a collider, then obviously we need a contact to push it out. If it starts near to the collider, then it might be pulled inside by other constraints, so we need something to, that's going to stop that from happening. And if the velocities mean that it's likely to be within that radius of the collider, then we also need to generate a contact. So what's the practical difference between these two different types of collisions? So here are two GIFs which demonstrate the difference, and it's quite like substantial. We have this um, capsule which is going to move. It's not like teleporting. It's moving in one frame from one side of the picture to the other. In the case of discrete collision detection, where we only test 
at the beginning or the end of the frame, it doesn't even notice, the cloth doesn't notice that the collider has done this. But in the predictive contacts case, um, we get the cloth reacting in a, in a pretty nice way. So there are a lot of artifacts associated with using predictive contacts. Like for instance, you can get fake collisions, that, collisions that wouldn't really happen if you subdivided the time step. But generally, these are much easier to ignore than the problems associated with it's doing discrete collision detection, which is that your, your cloth will just go through stuff. So this is a nice improvement. Um, so now let's talk a little bit about self-collision, and then we'll unite these things together and talk about self-collision with predictive contacts. So self-collision is cloth against itself, but we also use it to mean cloth against other bits of cloth. So for instance, in these two situations, I've got two bits of cloth which don't collide with themselves, they just collide with each other. And at a local level, in terms of generating and solving constraints, these two problems are exactly equivalent to each other. Um, so that there's, yeah, there's no difference. So here on the left, we have um, point, point self-collision. You, you need to choose which kind of primitive in your cloth you're actually going to like, run these calculations on. So you might say, well, it's a, it's a triangle mesh, there's points in the triangle mesh, I'm just gonna put spheres around these points and make sure that the spheres don't go through each other. And that is one way to do it, but you can obviously see in this GIF that there's a, a critical error with this, which is that if the cloth stretches, you might get gaps appearing between these points, and that's not gonna look nice when the, the cloth gets entangled or it slides through just because your tessellation isn't regular enough. Um, so one way you can deal with this is to run a full mesh self-collision, which is where you use the triangles rather than the points. Um, and um, as you can see on the right, this enables you to make the cloth much thinner because there's a continuous surface and you don't need to worry about gaps appearing. And generally this results in much higher quality. So this is what we've mostly concentrated on doing. Uh, so let's take a quick look at how you would implement point-point collision first. So here's a sort of simple example of the sort of thing you can do with this. So in this case, you've got two particles, both of which have some sort of radius, and we're trying to work out if they're going to be within a certain distance of each other within the frame. And this is actually not too difficult to just solve exactly. Having spent some time slagging off time of impact calculations, this is not a difficult problem to solve. It's just finding the closest distance between two lines. So this is not so bad. And you can work out, oh, well, they're gonna be quite near to each other. So we need to generate a contact to stop them from going through. So once we know that that's likely to happen, we need some sort of representation that we're going to put in the solver and solve later. Um, and in this case, um, you need to choose some sort of um, normal that you're going to uh, push them away from each other along. And um, what we do here is we just choose the normal at the beginning of the frame. You could choose the normal at, like at this point, the point at which they're touching, um, but we found this doesn't result in great behavior in terms of um, like robustness. So actually, uh, this works fine. It's just you just choose the discrete separating direction at the beginning of the frame, and make sure that they don't penetrate when they're pushed like along that normal. Um, and that will keep them the same side of each other as they started the frame on. Um, and you can encode this with just the uh, the index of each point and the normal, so that you know which line to project them along. So okay, let's look at full mesh collision now. Um, in order to make this robust, you need to do two different types of queries. So there's point triangle on the right and edge edge on the left. And if you don't do both different types of uh, constraint, then there will be some configurations that you can slot your cloth together in that will cause it to be able to interpenetrate. So there's actually two different types of constraints that we need to generate and solve here. Uh, so let's look at the point triangle case first. So what, th this is much harder to solve uh, exactly than the point point case. Um, and the, the reason for that is that uh, contrary to what peop most people are used to in games industry, um, all the points here are deforming. So there's no like rigidity that you can deal with. Um, and stuff like GJK isn't really gonna help you here. So um, what you can do is you can write down the equation that describes the distance between these primitives. So we've got the point on the left, it's got a velocity, and we've got a triangle on the right that's got some, each of its uh, vertices have velocity. Um, and if you write it down, you get a sixth order polynomial. Um, and then effectively what we're trying to find out is does this sixth order polynomial intersect some, some distance value at some point during the time interval between this time step and the next time step? And if it goes below that dotted line, then, well, we probably want to generate a contact because they're going to be near to each other. Um, but it is not nice trying to solve this equation. And actually, even if you ignore the, the part where we've got a radius on these things and you literally just try to find out if the point is gonna to touch 
the triangle itself. That is still a cubic polynomial that is very difficult to find the roots of. Um, and it's like a current, current research problem in SIGGRAPH papers to try to find an efficient way of doing this. Um, so we really didn't want to do this. Um, but this is the games industry, so of course we have unsupported hacks to deal with this. Um, so notionally, what we are doing, I call it a dynamic collision radius. Maybe that doesn't quite describe it very well. What it is is we are looking at the discrete problem at the beginning of the frame, and then we're making a bunch of assumptions that are not true, but they help. Um, and then we're using those assumptions to work out if we should generate a contact. And, if, and we have a, um, a parameter that we can, we can tweak, which enables things to be more or less conservative. And the idea is that we should just be really conservative if we want things to be, uh, if we want the behavior to be good. Well, we will generate far too many contacts, but that's okay. Um, and effectively what we're doing is we're just looking at the slope of this thing at the beginning of the time step, and we're saying, oh, well, that's gonna go, that's gonna hit the, uh, the green line. So let's just generate a contact. And we can make the green line higher, and that'll make it more uh, conservative. We'll generate more contacts, but that's okay. So how do we go about this? We've got these points with certain velocities. We can, look, we can find, with, without too much difficulty, the discrete separating direction between these things at the beginning of the time step. So that's just finding the closest point between this point and the triangle. That's not so bad. Um, and then we're just gonna do all of the rest of the problem along this separating direction, ignoring the fact that the separating direction changes as the time step goes on. So we project all the velocities that we have of these points onto this direction. Um, and for the triangle, we can look at this, the, the closest point to the beginning of the frame, and we can use barycentric interpolation to find the velocity of that point at the beginning of the frame. We say, oh, okay, these things are gonna be getting close to each other along this separating direction. Um, and in this case, it looks like they're gonna touch. So let's generate a contact. Um, and the nice thing about the point triangle case is that you actually don't need any floating point data at all to, to solve a contact between these things because the, the triangle has its own normal. Um, all you really need to encode is which side of the triangle the point started the frame at. So that means like which side of the cloth did it start? Is it the back face or the front face? So that's all you need here. Um, so I talked about this dynamic collision radius business. Um, this is the approximation that we do to, like, to, to true continuous collision detection. Here's a comparison that shows you that this is a useful thing to do, actually. Um, so on the left, uh, we have the dynamic collision radius turned on, and on the right, it's turned off. And there's very obvious intersections in this tape when we run it. Um, so this allows you to generate contacts that you wouldn't have generated otherwise. And one contact can be the difference between your tape getting inextricably tangled with, it, with itself and it being perfectly fine. Okay, so um, the edge edge case, we deal with similarly to the point triangle case, which is to say that we look at the discrete separating direction at the beginning of the frame and then interpolate. Um, and then at that point, we have these two virtual points along each line, which we can then apply the exact same constraint that we do in the point-point case. It's just that these points are like virtual points along each line rather than real points actually in the simulation. Um, and it, it's just one extra level in the math, so it doesn't make it much more complex. In this case, we do need to store a normal because edges in a mesh don't really have any global orientation. Like they don't have any intrinsic orientation. You might be able to generate some orientation from the mesh neighborhood, but we, we haven't looked at that yet. Um, and if you want details on this, I had to excise the details because this talk is short, but you can see them in our technical report. Okay, so um, if you've done physics, then you know what's coming up next. We're gonna talk about the broad phase. So um, we, we don't do anything particularly special in this case. Um, obviously, you don't want to look at every combination of triangle and other triangle in the mesh. Um, so what we do is we just have a basic AABB tree. Um, we look at the trajectories of each primitive. So if you're doing point versus point, then it might be an AABB tree that contains the points as its leaves, or it might be triangles. Um, and we uh, expand them along their trajectory during the frame, and then we just expand them by the radius of the things concerned. So if your cloth is quite thick, then we expand it by that. We also add this extra static collision radius on top, which is like the epsilon um, of which, if things are close enough, then we want to generate a contact anyway. So the takeaway for this is that um, we end up creating quite a fat AABB tree, and that means that because, because our method for getting things to be robust is to add radius to all of our primitives. Um, so our things are quite sort of cubic and fat. And that actually means that stuff like a KDOP tree, like more complex primitives, 
probably not that useful for, for this algorithm. That's nice because this is nice and simple. And uh, yes, I put Ericsson real-time collision detection there. That's the orange book that you should get if you're interested in this. Um, so we unite all these things together into a tree, and then we can query this tree to find pairs of things which may be intersecting, and we can do our uh, narrow phase collision detection or contact generation uh, on those pairs. Okay, so let's take a quick look at how things are authored here. This is a very fast-paced video, so I'm going to have to talk quickly. So we've got this Maya plugin here, which uh, allows you to uh, real-time uh, simulate and tweak the uh, cloth simulation. So we've got a region system here, which will allow you to set up different regions in the mesh. So here I'm painting this with the blue region. So there's two regions here, and then you get this, uh, the bottom thing here, which I'm about to edit. You get a uh, lower triangular matrix, which lets you choose which kind of self-collision you get on these. So here I've chosen point-point. So the, um, these two regions are going to interact with each other via point-point collision detection. They're not going to interact with themselves. Um, so here you can see that, oh, it looks all right. Um, and you can change the, uh, the radius in real time while the simulation is running. Um, however, you can see that one piece of cloth is hovering over the other. So that's obviously not great. And when I decrease the radius, one falls through the other. So yeah, we're not keen on that. Um, and it turns out that in order to make point-point collision detection robust, you need to make your points very thick, uh, which is not good. So here I've changed it to use uh, full mesh collision detection instead. And uh, when my mouse catches up to it, it's going to yeah, turn the debug drawing back on. And you can see that I can make it much thinner um, and like closer to the thickness of a real piece of cloth. And you can see that it flops down nicely and stays nice and stable. And um, there's less of a shadow between them, so you can see it's a bit more believable. And I can turn down the radius to quite small, and it, it stays. Obviously, if you turn down the radius to zero, then our, our method fails. Um, but that, uh, you, you can make it fairly re realistic. Um, yeah, so that is our, our, basically our whole authoring pipeline. Um, so let's take a look at some results. Uh, I, when I started this, I was kind of comparing it with methods from the academic literature, from SIGGRAPH papers, so that's mostly what my test cases were. And you'll see that the performance numbers are atrocious, but this is just to show that we can do the same sort of stuff as you would do in a high quality simulation. So here we've got a tape, and it uh, uses triangle collision detection, and, it, um, and you, you can wrap it around nicely, and you don't get any nasty jittering or anything. It's nice and stable. And here is another classic test that you may have seen if you've seen cloth papers from SIGGRAPH, we have a cloth which falls onto a sphere and it curls round. And um, if your simulation is working badly, then it'll generate a lot of self-intersections at this point, but ours remains intersection-free. However, this is one second per frame. So yeah, you can't put this in a game. So OK, what happens if we try to do something a little bit less ambitious? Uh, so here's something that's like just a couple of layers of clothing over each other. Maybe they're next to a, like the leg of a character, something like, like a Titan mark from Destiny. Um, might look a lot like this if you simulated it with cloth. So um, we can see that immediately they just get entangled and they never disentangle. Um, and the reason for this is that like, I've put a very um, violent, a violent animation on this like, leg collider. Um, but this is totally representative of the sort of stuff you might find in a game, because game characters are superhuman in terms of the motion they can go through. Um, so this is a completely unacceptable situation. And you can make this robust, but it's really expensive. For, some, for such a tiny piece of cloth, it's really not worth it. So what can we do about this? Well, time for more tricks and hacks. Um, so in this case, we have layers of clothing. And actually, um, we're, we're being really dumb because we're looking at the beginning of every frame, which side of this point locally is this triangle locally? Um, but actually, we know that one layer should be above the other layer. That's like global information that we can just set up. Um, so in this case, we say, OK, well, I'm just going to hard code which direction, like which side of the triangle the points should be. And when you generate the contacts, um, you just override where it was at the beginning of the frame. And you can see that this actually becomes completely robust as a result. Um, so if your points get into the, the region where they would generate a contact, even if it's on the wrong side of the triangle, they'll end up popping up to the right side. Um, and this looks pretty nice. Um, I, I'd like to point out here that the upper layer of cloth does not collide with the collider. It only collides with the cloth. So all of that motion from there is, comes out of the self-collision. Um, and this is 0.2 milliseconds per frame. So it's still it's reasonably expensive, but um, it shows you can get robustness with this kind of material. Um, and here is another situation which kind of exploits the, the layered clothing idea as well. You've got like sort of a, 
like a model of a flamenco skirt, I guess. And there are some leg colliders underneath there that you can't quite see, but it's just being jostled around. And you can see that the, the two layers actually slide over each other quite convincingly. Um, you don't see them penetrating through each other. And this is three milliseconds per frame. So this is, again, even though it's still quite simple, it's kind of outside the realm of, uh, of being, puttable, it, being able to put it in a game. OK, so it's still expensive. What are we going to do about this? Well, in the case of layered clothing, which is actually a really big like, subset of the sort of cloth that you would want to simulate in a game, most bits of cloth only stay within the same sort of region of other layers like all the time. So why are we wasting all our time doing collision detection um, when we're just going to end up with basically the same results every frame? So what you can do is you can just like, do the collision detection once at the beginning or even in the pipeline and serialize out the results. And then you can solve these contacts um, every frame and just see what, see what the results look like. I mean, you may be solving contacts which wouldn't have been generated if you had run the collision detection, but that may not be a huge deal. So in this case, um, this actually works perfectly and you see no difference at all. Um, so we're, now long, we're no longer doing any collision detection at runtime. We're only solving the contacts um, and it cuts the, uh, the total cost of the simulation by an order of magnitude. So as long as your cloth looks like something is isomorphic to this in some way, um, you can do a very efficient simulation using this hack. Um, so I was asked to provide a game-ready asset, and much uh, sweat and tears later, here is uh, Darth Maul from Star Wars Battlefront 2, and thank you to the Battlefront 2 team for letting me have this. Um, so he's got this layered skirt on. Uh, if you play the game, you'll see that the cloth simulation on it looks good, but it, it doesn't have any sort of layering. Um, and here, he's just running through some calisthenics animation. I mean, I, I did this, the simulation myself, so um, it's missing some like art polish. Um, but what I want you to notice is that um, the layers may uh, penetrate through each other like momentarily when he's going through some very violent animation, but they always resolve to being the right side of each other. And that's what's important, is that the steady state be not obviously broken. Um, Game is a very resistant, like very happy to be shown stuff which is broken as long as it doesn't stay on frame for too long. Um, but yeah, so he can go through these unrealistically violent animations and it always ends up in the right place and it, it matches like the art directed pose. So this is like a, a real time simulation and uh, it turns out that you can make this not overly expensive. So in this case, the total cost on my PC is 380 microseconds for the entire solve. Um, and of that, 150 milli uh, microseconds is the self-collision constraint being solved. And I should also point out that our cloth solver is not, um, uh, not multi-threaded. And most of it is SIMD, but the, uh, the self-collision stuff has no SIMD in it at all. So you could potentially cut that cost by like three times. So if you have the right kind of asset, um, Self-collision is, is totally something which you can have right now for, for not too much expense. Um, and I'd like to point out that, as I said, I'm not an artist, so there's probably other ways that you could make that stuff less expensive, but I didn't have enough time to make that happen. OK, so what, what sort of directions is this going to go in? So as I said, there's performance left on the table. There's other things we could do, especially with regards to the broad phase, if we wanted to invest in actually running collision detection. Obviously, if you're not running it, then you don't need to optimize it. Um, another thing is that the contact caching, which I talked about, is very naive. So we literally just generate the contacts as if we were doing it in, um, in a regular simulation time step and then serialize them. But maybe you could have some kind of editor which would let the artist say, well, this triangle contacts with this point um, and not this one. Um, and that would probably allow you to deal with some uh, edge cases which, which wouldn't look good with this current system. And of course, I've shown you all these layered clothing uh, examples and tried hard to convince you that this is a good kind of self-collision, but there's lots of other kinds like tying knots in scarves and um, like dropping tapes on the floor. And we don't really have a performance solution for these right now because it's very difficult to predict which bits are going to contact which other bits in a given uh, simulation. So um, in that case, you might have to do some genuine continuous collision detection with some sort of time of impact query. Um, or use the GPU, of course, that's always uh, a big hammer that you can throw at problems.
So, thank you very much for listening to my talk, and I'd like to acknowledge these people, and remember there's a technical report, and uh, Frostbite Physics is hiring, so come and talk to me after this. And um, yes, I think that's it, so thank you very much. <laughs>